now, you're tuned in to RBLR, the home of Tampa Bay's Reveler Sports. Hello and welcome back to your RBLR Rays show. With me once again is Pat Devonport. Pat, how you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing good. Uh, the nights are getting a bit longer. The days are getting a bit shorter. It's autumn time officially now, and we got some long, dark days ahead for a long and dark off season, which we're going to start addressing today. But I'm also feeling a little bit like a satanic cult leader because I'm wearing my Bring Back the Devil yes. uh, t-shirt, um, which I'm sure will get some strange looks uh, throwing my way around the UK. Yeah, um, probably not a whole lot of uh, knowledge of the Devil Rays over there. Probably no, uh, known as the as the thing that that got Steve Irwin really, and that's <laughs> yeah, which is really really unfortunate. I was a huge. I don't. Did you watch? Did you watch Crocodile Hunter all as a kid? No, not really. Not really. See, I was a humongous Crocodile Hunter fan when I was a kid, and my parents didn't tell me like for like a couple days because they didn't know how I was going to react. And I think my cousin called me and told me that that he had passed away, and I like cried for like three hours. Um, that's like by far the most impactful like celebrity death because I was really attached. I wanted to go work at Australia Zoo, like that was my whole life plan. Man. I got I got halfway there because I I cover a team that has. That has uh, Devil Rays in it. That was my cat. Thank you, Pam, for that. That was awesome. She's um, just hyped up about this episode. Yep, That's she all. is. Thank you for that, Pam. That was awesome. Uh, okay. Uh, anyway, thank you all for for joining us, even through uh, cat hurricanes. Thank you, Pam. Um, <laughs> And continuing to like, subscribe, and follow us all throughout the offseason. We're going to have some really fun topics uh, as we kind of look at what this team did this year and what they're going to do next year. Make sure you're around for all of that because it's going to be fun. Um, getting into sort of the the, the beginning of this offseason, what we want to do a little bit is kind of take a look at the state of the roster um, right now and, and discuss where wherever where we're at in the different areas, how we feel up confidence level, about every single area of the roster. So, uh, Pat, I'll let you get started. What's a what's a roster area that you have a lot of confidence in right now? Uh, in terms of the most confident area for me is probably, I would say, the bullpen. I think the bullpen, despite having a couple of uh, known names likely to depart in free agency in Jake Diekman, uh, Robert Stevenson, and Chris Davinsky as a late addition, he's going back off as a free agent as well. We've still got a whole host of excellent arms in the bullpen. We've still got uh, Kittredge, Fairbanks, Poche, Kevin Kelly, um, and we might even see the emergence of the likes of Colton White. Uh, Jalen Beeks is also sitting as like a back end, like if you need him guy. Uh, and I'm sure something that the Rays will always do is they'll sign some minor league free agents. They'll bring in some guys from like trades that are completely under the radar. And then they'll end up throwing meaningful innings for us. The bullpen is always something that I'd never stress about because the Rays have this kind of arm generation machine that just brings quality relievers out nowhere and uh, i kind of just sleep and never really think about the bullpen because i'm like it'll be fine the Rays will just get some guys and i won't know who they are and then i will in two months and be like they're the best reliever in baseball yeah and i think this season showed that more than really any other because for the first time in a while there was actually some questions about the Rays bullpen through the first few months of the season the the opinion of the media at large, the fan base at large was the bullpen's not as good as it has been. And it was starting to even trickle into like some, some mainstream stuff of like, Hey, the Rays bullpen is in trouble. And then of course they ride at the ship as they always do. And I think that just goes to show that this team is uniquely skilled at finding and equipping bullpen arms to succeed. And they're going to continue to do that. They have excellent arms in the bullpen. I'm sure they will go out and get, people as they need i think colby white is a really good call out as someone who will be uh a big part of this or of this uh excuse me bullpen going forward and i also think you think about a guy like zach Lattell, who is in the starting rotation right now because of circumstances but when he is no longer needed in the starting role he's going to come in now as a bullpen role and, and be an excellent arm in that situation as well so i think this team is very well equipped 
within the bullpen going forward. I, I, I agree with you. The bullpen is one of my least concerned areas going forward into this offseason. Yeah, absolutely. And even if uh, we see the emergence of Jeffrey Springs, Drew Rasmussen later in the season, mm -hmm. they probably won't be straight away coming in and throwing five innings. They'll probably be yeah. pitching after an opener. They might do a one time through the lineup type thing. And even if, you know, Rasmussen especially could be back in September time, they might just go, listen, you're going to be our back end of the bullpen guy for one year, just while you're recovering. Uh, and that could be a thing too. Shane Bars, we don't really know his fate yet. You'll probably get trialed as a starter, but could right. also end up moving into a relief role, a bit like Luis Patino did. Hopefully Bars has a bit more in him than Patino ended up having. But uh, you, yeah. yeah, I think so too. I'm optimistic about that. But you've got so much to play around with in the bullpen, so many options that, yeah, like you said, not really needing to be concerned. My only real kind of gripe is it's very right-handed. Uh, Poche is the only lefty currently right. in the pen that you can truly rely on. So I would expect the Rays' priority when looking for arms uh, left-handers. So do you think there's a really good chance? Do you think they're going to make a good run at Diekman to bring him back? I think he's more likely than than Stevenson, for sure. I think Stevenson is going to get a heck of a lot of money from a team like the Dodgers or the Astros. Um, Diekman is going to be is going to be the guy that is probably still in the ballpark for a, for a one or two year deal. The Rays hate um, signing multi year deals for relievers, yeah. so if they get that elsewhere, which I think Stevenson definitely will, they may take a walk. But that's fine. That suits the Rays. They don't really want to spend money in that area either because there's so many cheap arms available that you can pick up. Do you think there's a chance that because Stevenson had that breakout that he thinks, hey, I did really well here. I might want to stay here. You think there's any chance he takes a hometown discount and comes back for a little bit less just because he of the success that he had here last year? Do you think there's any chance something like that could happen? I mean, never say never. Uh, but I'm 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 really pessimistic. I'm willing to be pleasantly surprised but i'm really pessimistic that he's going to return just because those numbers that he was putting up with the rays are absolutely insane and yeah. there's teams that are willing to just spend money in that area that uh the rays will not i think the rays are positioned to make some runs at some high priced players uh, given the opportunity as they have kind of dipped their toes into which we'll talk about later but uh the bullpen is not going to be that area I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I think I think you're absolutely right because the when you look in the offseason, one of the first thing teams look to is bullpen help. And in, in in a market where there's just often so few really good options, if you see someone with the kind of statistics that Stevenson has available, it's going to be a free for all to get him. So I agree. Unfortunately, we'll probably we'll probably lose Bob Steve. Thank you for your service. If you, if if you are gone, I would really like to see Deepman back though. I do think there's a pretty good chance of that. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Zach, we talked about an area that we're super confident in. Uh, let's keep it on the on the pitching side. Let's talk about that starting rotation. It's a bit banged up to begin the year. What's your kind of viewpoint on where we start 2024 rotation wise? Yeah, I think if we I think if we're viewing these, if we're looking at our position groups as like a high, medium, low level of confidence, I would say my confidence level in the rotation is medium. Just to because if we look at what the rotation is likely to be going into next year, we're looking at probably I would say Tyler Glasnow opening day starter. Eflin could do it too. It doesn't really matter that they're, they're one A one B at this point. And then it starts to get a little more interesting. Savali is he your number three starter? Is Latell your number three starter? I. Th it seems like Shane Boz is going to be available to start next year because he did get into some rehab games to end this year. So it would it would seem at least that we're Shane Boz is going to be available. The question to me is going to be: Are they going to start him in AAA? Are they going to bring him straight up to the majors? I, that's tough to say. I think by necessity, either Boz or Bradley will start in the majors. I, Boz has had a significant significantly more success consistent success in the majors even though they both have very small sample sizes boss has been more successful in the major at the major league level than bradley has been so i i think depending on how they perform in spring training and over the offseason i think there's a good chance we look we are the rotation coming out of the offseason looks something like tyler efflin uh 
Latell, Savali, and then Boz. And then it's going to be kind of Boz or um, Bradley is kind of for that last spot. And that's where I think I feel awesome about one and two. And if you if Bradley or Boz are your number five, I'm pretty good with that. Like they're, they're gonna that's a pretty good number five starter. The three and the four do give me a little bit of like mm, I don't love that scenario. I don't I don't love it. I still think it's a very good starting rotation. And if you if you match it up against the other rotations in the league, I think it stacks up well. But there does give me some pause. That being said, I think Savali could make a big jump. A lot of the under the hood metrics for him, as we as we've discussed previously, a lot of his under the hood metrics were still pretty good throughout the season. Um, so I expect him to kind of have a bounce back year a little bit in his second year with the organization. But if like if you're just talking right now based on what we've seen most recently, I would say it's like medium confident. Like I'm I'm fine with it. I don't think they need to go and spend a lot of money on it because you have three aces basically that are just chilling and are going to be rehabbing and are going to be available either at the end of this season or at least at the start of next season. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to, at least to me to spend money on the pitching right now, because you have guys that are going to be coming back from injury and guys who are young and are developing. Cause there's a real chance that Bradley and Boz are both in the majors next year and that they're both contributing really good, meaningful innings. So I, I think there's a really good chance that the, the we are a little bit, my confidence would be medium to start the season, but it could become high very quickly. And as soon as Springs and Rasmussen are back available, it goes straight to high. Like, because a rotation with Tyler Glasnow, Zach Eflin, Jeffrey Springs, and Drew Rasmussen available is an elite, elite rotation. And when Shane gets back, then, you know, then it's the best rotation in baseball again, which is what it should have been this year. But thank you to the injury bug, it was not. I'm medium yeah. confident right now, but with, with a chance to go up as, um, as the season goes on. Interesting. So you, you're saying that this is, we leave the rotation kind of as it stands right now. We don't need to yeah. spend money. There is an opportunity here and an interesting opportunity or, or conundrum that has been discussed quite heavily is obviously the raise payroll. If we run it back with the same roster, which has been implied kind of what the, the plan is, is to mostly mm -hmm. run it back with improving at the fringe or the margins. Tyler Glasnow uh, is set to earn $25 million next year. That's a lot of money by Ray's standards. Um, that would account for about a sixth of their payroll next year, if, um, if the current projections are correct. Mm -hmm. Is there an opportunity to not spend money, but perhaps save money? Do you think the Rays could possibly afford to ship Tyler Glasnow off while his uh, value is high, get some help elsewhere on the roster, maybe pick up some prospects, maybe pick up uh, someone that will help the Major League roster right now and unload that hefty salary of Glasnow's elsewhere? I think that would be essentially rotation suicide if they did that, because you're now because if you remove Tyler Glass now and Zach Eflin trips over a log on a on a on a brisk, you know, spring walk, you're 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 sunk. Because now Latell is your number one starting pitcher in that scenario. I, like I, I've seen this take a lot on social media that they're gonna move on from Glass now. I don't think that like I don't think race fans are being real with themselves here. Do you understand what this rotation looks like without Tyler Glass now? Because Springs and Rasmussen are not going to be mainline starters this year. We may get Springs back towards the end of the uh, middle of the year as a like build up over time starter. And maybe Rasmussen will come back as a, like a, a bullpen guy at the end of the year. You still got to get five six innings from somebody, and they're, they're not just you know growing on trees. So if you trade a top of the line starter who is already in your organization, you're just you know you're just kind of you're you're, you're trading from a you're trading from a position that is no longer a strength because you're you guys are hurt. If this was if this was next off season when all these guys were talking about are healthy again. Yeah, I could see them trading him at that at that point because you know they're they're maybe going to have to pay some of these guys too. So like maybe they could trade him then. This offseason, I think there is no chance. And if they do trade him, I will this this confidence goes from medium to low very fast. And it's this and and especially because of what I just said. If there's an injury and you don't have Glass now, you're in really big trouble because now you're 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 putting you know you're you're putting somebody who really does not need to be in the rotation back in the rotation and you, like 
the depth that we had last year was we used every bit of it. So if we go into next year at the same level that we ended last year, we're using all of our depth. There's only so much more depth to go. And guys are developing. A guy like Mason Montgomery maybe could be ready by midseason to kind of come up and provide some innings, although he would he would did not have as amazing an end of the year as we would have maybe liked. But maybe somebody like that could come up and be okay. But I just think that would be a huge mistake from a roster construction. That's what we're talking about, roster construction. That's a bad roster construction move because the value you're going to get back for him would, would be great for sure, but it's not going to help this team win a World Series next year. And that would seem to be anti their philosophy of get as many cracks at the apple as you possibly can and bites at the apple. And anyway, as you possibly can in this window. And in my opinion, if you trade glass now, you're kind of, I don't, Hunting is a very strong word, but you're definitely not putting yourself in the best position to succeed this year. So I really don't see it happening. Yeah, I completely, I completely uh, understand what you're saying. My only, my only little uh, niggle is, is Tyler Glass now the guy that we can depend to go out there and do it? Because he is extremely excellent when he is healthy. He has not put together a full healthy season since essentially coming to the Rays, maybe 2019. Really? Can we I mean, count yeah. on him as the ace of the staff this year? So that's a really good point. And to that end, I would say you could maybe convince me that Eflin is number one and Glasnow is number two because Eflin has shown he can be available. So that's a, that's a very fair point. My, my counter to that is if you trade Glasnow, what are you getting back? probably not a pitching prospect if you're tr uh, probably not pitching because if you trade him you're going to trade to somebody who needs pitching so you're not going to get pitching back so then you're going to have to go get pitching somewhere else which means you're going to have to give up more assets to go get pitching i just feel like it's a gamble to, to move on from him if you don't have a really strong plan and maybe they've seen Taj is under i mean or um bradley's under not bradley boz is underlying numbers and they think He's going to be the guy. We we believe in this guy. He's going to be our number two guy next year. We have no worries. Maybe they have. Maybe they've seen stuff that we don't know about. But I haven't seen it yet. So I need I need Tyler Glass now still on this roster for me to have confidence in this rotation going into next year. Because again, if you say we're going to lose Tyler for some of the year, probably. But if you say we're going to have him for none of the year. And then we're going to put stress on these other guys who we then may lose for a little bit as well because they're going to have wear and tear on them. Now we're talking about, yeah, remember Cooper Criswell? You're going to be seeing a lot more of him. I don't think that's yeah. a world in which the Rays really want to be in right now. If we can serve, if we can get to the half halfway through the year, we start to get springs back, and if maybe the you know the the deadline approaches and we can add there, but or we get or we start to get springs and Rasmussen back, then we're in a little bit more of a comfort zone where we could maybe make a move like that. But right now, it's just not a good time for, in my opinion. I think again, if we had guys healthy, this is a different conversation. If Shane is healthy, if if Springs is healthy, if Rasmussen is healthy, this is a different conversation. And and it's probably goodbye glass now, but that's not the situation we're in right now. Glasnow's value to this team, in my opinion, is higher than any package we could get back from any other team because his value is not going to be as high for them as they, he is for us because we are in a bad place if we lose him for an extended period of time, like we would if we traded him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're you're, you're pretty much on the money. I think. I think Glasnow would. When Glasnow signed that contract a couple of years ago, where he was earning five mil in 2023 and then 25 mil for the upcoming 2024 season, I think a lot of us raised our eyebrows and go, that is a big raise and that's a lot for the Rays to be spending on, on one player, especially one that has had health troubles when he signed the contract. Uh, and I think maybe the original plan was to build back his value and then unload him for that final year because that doesn't seem like a very raised thing to do to just keep a $25 million player on the roster that has health issues. Yeah. But since circumstances have changed right now, we do not have the depth to accommodate a Tyler Glasnow trade, unless we have something very special in mind to replace him either yeah. on the free agent market or via a different trade elsewhere. And trades are always uh, a dangerous game to play, to build a roster behind, especially when you're trying to find a key piece because it takes two to tango and you can never guarantee that uh, it's going to line up with another team's needs, basically. So, yeah, the Tyler Glasnow situation is a sticky one, but we would say 
I think overall Glasnow is very likely to stay. Yeah, I, I think so. I think if they move him, something else would have to be coming for, for, for that to happen. And right now I just don't see it. So I, I think I think he stays. Okay, let's go to the position player side of things right now. The infield is actually in a mostly healthy place. I would say three quarters of the way in a really good place. Uh, we got Yandy, who's going to be our first baseman. Easy peasy, lock that in. Uh, then we've got Brandon Lau. He'll be fully healthy come spring training. He'll be our second baseman. Easy peasy, lock that in. Paredes is going to be our third baseman. Easy peasy, lock that in. Shortstop. This is where we have our issue. Currently, right now, Taylor Walls is probably the opening day shortstop, assuming nothing changes. Uh, we've mm -hmm. got to be honest. I would be very surprised if Wanda Franco is on the team uh, come opening day 2024. Um, we could get a resolution this offseason, but I think what the Rays have got to do if they, is they've got a plan for the worst case scenario, which in this instance, from a sporting perspective, is that Wanda Franco is not going to be on the team come 2024. That means you've got what was essentially a seven war player gone, never to return with nothing back. Uh, which is a really hard thing to try and replace. And I don't think it's even possible to replace that in the immediate term. Walls is a guy that you know can play shortstop and play it to a high level in terms of the defensive side of things. He had a bit of struggles in the playoffs and, you know, he's not the perfect defender, but lots of his uh, eye test stuff, it looks really, really good uh, defensive wise. He does not hit very well and that is that is who he is as a player. He got off to a bit of a hot start last year, but then he quickly regressed to being a below average hitter again. And that begs the question, and I'll pitch it to you first. Do we take the chance on Basabe or Caminero? I have not seen enough of Caminero at shortstop to make a determination on his ability to play every day. I think the bat, I would be pretty happy to see that bat at shortstop every day. The glove is another story. You you cannot really afford to run someone out there at shortstop who has a subpar glove, especially especially now with the shift rules. In previous years, in the years of the shift, you could potentially hide a bad defensive shortstop out there with a really good defensive third baseman or a really good defensive second baseman. You could do that. You can't really hide a bad defensive shortstop anymore because the, the, all that area of the field's got to be covered now and you can't really have somebody shift over to, to help him. So you have to be confident in his glove. The fact that when he came up, he was he only played shortstop once leads me to believe the Rays are not confident in his ability to play shortstop, especially considering the, the circumstance of the shortstop position when he did come up. They're not confident in him at shortstop, at least I don't think so right now. Everything that we have seen points to walls probably being the opening day shortstop basabe is the interesting one he cooled off pretty significantly after a hot start i would not mind seeing him getting another shot at shortstop i wouldn't mind that i'd be fine with that um i just you know i just don't know what else they can i'm just not sure what else they're going to do right now and i think that's kind of my concern right now so i guess i'll ask you if i think and maybe I, you can disagree with me on this i think if you look at first base second base third base confidence level high as it can be i love everything going on there you got mead and Caminero that also can fill in at those positions uh i have no con i have no issues those are like excellent no problem at all when you get to shortstop my confidence is very low right now yeah. it's the only position on the team that my confidence is low what's your thought yeah i'm also low i'm not a the biggest taylor walls fan in the world i i understand the value he brings from a defensive point of view and the versatility he brings that he can play second and third at a high degree as well but he needs to be your utility guy he needs to be the guy off the bench that plays different positions when needed, when guys need a day off. His bat does not play any higher than that. If you run him out there every day, you're costing yourself. Um, and I, I worry about a full 162 games of Taylor Walls. And 
I really had to rack my brain going, okay, if the Rays seek help, and I agree that I don't think Caminero should uh, start the season at the major league level. I think he should start somewhere where he's going to get consistent reps, and that will most likely be at AAA, I would say. Basabe takes the role of the utility guy, but again, you could probably flip and reverse them and get similar results, I would say. But um, where do we go? And I looked at the free agent shortstops this year, it's it's uh, it's grim out there, man. Uh, people that you could call on for maybe a one year deal, uh, Kike Hernandez, who's like not the worst for a one year deal. He brings some versatility. Uh, you could go for Tim Anderson, but he gives me I, I do I don't want Tim Anderson. I think he's essentially worse than Taylor Walls <laughs> as a full package now and yeah. more expensive. Um, at least that's what he showed last year. Um, Isaiah kind of falefa again, probably a sideways step to Taylor Walls, maybe yeah. a slightly better bat, but not worth it for the that money much. that you demand. Brandon Crawford, again, probably a sideways step to Taylor Walls. It's just, it's, it's tough. The only player that I could see as a fit, as like a, a kind of band-aid on the shortstop situation, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, is a trade option. Uh, Tommy Edmond from the St. Louis Cardinals. I don't hate that idea. I just kind of don't see it as like a super significant upgrade. And I don't know what he would cost. Um, I think maybe that, that's something that they could, they could, they could try. I don't really know. I actually have another trade idea that I want to throw out at you that I was thinking okay. that I was thinking about. I was looking the same. I did the same thing as you. I went and looked at the market and it's just, it's, it's grim. Exactly what you're, it's exactly what you said. He, the only thought, the only person that I saw out there that was on trade list of like, this guy might get traded this offseason that, that made me think, hmm, was a uh, a guy that we know, that we've seen before at the Trout on a team that, even though they made the playoffs last year, is kind of in a weird spot right now. They may trade their ace. They may move some pieces because they're kind of in a weird rebuilding phase, and that's the Milwaukee Brewers. And they have a shortstop that we know very well. What are your thoughts on Willie Adamas bringing him back? Ah, oh, this is yeah, this is sad. Okay, so Willie Adamas, I am Willie Adamas's biggest fan in the whole <laughs> world. I have got the oh, biggest soft spot, the most love for Willie Adamas of maybe anyone ever. I love Willie Adamas. I don't want him back. Wow. I don't want him back, and this is why. Uh, one, I, I just want him to do well, and the. The trop, he can't, he can't hit at the trop. He's admitted to it himself. He can't see at the trop. He struggles to see the ball at the trop. And while he's got a lot more pop in his bat than Walls, Basabe, and he plays an excellent bit of defense, he will not be able to hit at home. And that yeah. is not great. I love the idea, and I would be doing laps around my sofa. I would be you know, shouting from the rooftops if we did get him because he's just such a lovable presence and he is that just, he's, he's such, he's, oh, I love him so much. But he is probably not the fit, I don't think. My only idea with Tommy Edmund is he's still in ARB, so he's quite cheap. That's true. Um, he does not strike out, really. Um, he always puts the ball into play, which is something that I, I value quite highly. Um, he's 86th percentile in uh, fielding run value. So he, he's just as good of a glove. And when we get a more permanent shortstop, like if Camonero develops or if we decide that we want Taylor Walls there, Edmund has the same kind of utility that he can play all over the infield. Um, he's 96th percentile in out above average, 88th percentile mm. sprint speed. He's got all the makings of a great super utility guy. And I think he's actually basically... Uh, a step forward on walls in every step of the game. And but that would mean replacing walls probably completely with Tommy Edmund. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm pulling up some of uh, Edmund's stats right now. He's basically a league average bat with a lot of, like we've, like you're saying, a lot of really up, a lot of upside from a defensive perspective, that utility perspective. Um, he is, he generated, um, the interesting thing with him is he generated almost six baseball or uh fan graphs war last not this last season but the season before last so he has so he definitely has the ability to create value 
which is really interesting when you look at when because when you I think when you talk about shortstop, you want someone who's going to create value at that position. So, and if you look at Taylor Walls, he he's never had a full season the way that Edmund has has had a full season of you know of playing time, but he's he's never had an uh, WRC plus over an entire season higher than um, Tommy Edmund, at least over the last couple of years. So, I mean, I would definitely be, I would be open to it. I think it's a, I think it's as good as a suggestion, as realistic a suggestion as is out there right now. So I would definitely be open to the concept. I think my, my biggest issue, and this is, and this is more, more an issue with what I've, this is a very devil's advocate thing for me to say right now. And, and that is because I, I'm hearing what you're hearing. And that is that the team's going to stand pat. They, if they make a Tommy Edmund type move, that's probably all they're going to do. They're going to basically stand pat. They're happy with it. They're going to run it back with the team as is. My issue with, with that is I think as we're discussing this, we talk about the rest of the roster. We're going to talk about the outfield and the catcher too. I think it's a not, not really a spoiler. We're pretty happy with those positions too. We'll get into it a little bit more, but I'm pretty happy with those positions. If you were a GM coming into this team right now and you, and, and, and you and the, the, the owner of the team told you to look at this team and said, what is the thing that can take me and and take take this team as constructed and make them a World Series contender? You'd say, okay. You'd look at the team. You'd say, well, I got value in the outfield. I got value at center field. I got power at center field. I got power on the corners in the outfield. Maybe you could do a little bit more, but that'd be a marginal upgrade. Be really expensive to upgrade there. So I, I don't know. Uh, but the power is still really good. It's still really good there. We have great, you know, right side of the infield. And third base is excellent. Catcher is above league average in, in, in power output and good defense. The the starting rotation, once they get healthy, is excellent. The bullpen is excellent. There's only really one hole on this team. There's the, and, and, man, it would sure be nice to have a seven more shortstop available to, to, yeah. to plug in there because that would put this team over the hump. And I think it's very obvious this team was built around Wander Franco. We've kind of been talking around it and mentioning it here and there. This team was built around Wander. It's not a, this is not a like, this is not a like opinion. This is not a like, well, I think this is like clearly a fact. This team was constructed with Wander Franco as the centerpiece of this team. If he is not available, this team is, is, is lesser because of that, because this team was not constructed to not have Wander Franco available for an extended period of time. We can tell that with the, with the economic investment, you could tell that with the way the players have been built around him, you can tell by the way that the only really heir apparent as a shorts, as a true shortstop is at least a year away in Carson Williams. They have, they were not, they do, their organization was not planning to have to replace him anytime soon. So this, so to go into the, to go into next season, with with being okay with not upgrading there, I don't like it. The problem is that there's, as we're discussing, what do you do? There's like, there's just not a whole lot of good options. Good shortstops are not something that a team just throws around and says, "Ah, we can. I guess we can let that go." There's not a whole lot of them that are really elite, and they're, and people are not just going to pass on them whenever they want, and they're going to be super expensive. So, and I think that kind of leads to um, another question that that we get if we if we're just accepting that we're probably not going to have Wander Franco going into the start of next season. Do you think this team can still win a world series without him? If this team is constructed, maybe some, some marginal upgrades. If we run it back with the roster as we're, as we currently sit, do you think this team can win a world series? I'm having to pause about it, but I'm going to say yes. I think this is still a team, particularly in this new playoff format where there's three wild cards now, and essentially you need 87 wins in the American League to make the playoffs. Yeah, I think this team is very much capable of easily putting up a 90-plus win season if we run it back. That means we're in the playoffs. And then at that point, it's all a case of hoping we don't just stop playing our usual brand of place, brand of place. Brand of baseball. There's a tongue twister for you. Um, we got to stop turning up to the playoffs and then completely folding. But what's yeah. the odds that happens four years in a row, right? Nah. Um, so I think, yeah, I think this team can make the playoffs. And then we just got to hope that we can play a good brand of baseball once the playoffs actually begin, actually score some runs, uh, get a bit of lucky bounces here our way. Because let's be honest, the Texas Rangers are no better than the Rays were this year. If anything, they were worse. 
And here they are, right in the thick of things with the Houston Astros. They went seven games undefeated in the playoffs. That could happen to the Rays just as easily next year, even if they had Juan de Franco gone. So yes, I do think this team, if we run it back next year, will be capable of winning a World Series. But they're making it deliberately harder on themselves by choosing not to find areas to upgrade. And I think there are areas that you could upgrade. And I think there are things that you can do that make your life a little easier from a roster construction standpoint, that if they choose not to do it, I will be a little annoyed. Yeah, I think, you know, I I actually agree with you. Even though I'm the one who posed the question, I agree. I think this team can still win a World Series. And what I will point to is the Atlanta Braves, who won the World Series without their best player, probably. And, and Ronald Acuna Jr. So it's definitely doable. And I kind of and I kind of agree with, with with you that they're they're putting themselves at a detriment to not make a big improvement there. So then the question then becomes is okay if you're if you if there is if you can't get seven if you're gonna lose seven war from the shortstop position, where else could you add it? Does that like does, does that make does my question make sense? Like if you're saying we're gonna subtract seven war from shortstop, we're gonna add maybe two war. We got five war we got to find somewhere. Where do you think those those five wins above replacement could come from, either from the organization or outside the organization? Where is a place we could inject that war into this roster? Can I say something and you can promise not to get mad at me? Sure. Shohei Otani. Oh, I knew that's what you were going to say. I'm not <laughs> mad at you because I was thinking it too. It's – see, and, and – okay, you want, you want my big – Tinfoil hat conspiracy theory. This is my this is my tinfoil hat for, for the offseason for Shohei Otani, right? He's hurt right now. Will would do you think he would get the most value in a long term deal right now or after he's back pitching? Well, after he's back pitching. So here's my tinfoil hat theory. He will decide that I'm not gonna get a long term deal right now. I'm gonna wait. I'm still pretty young. I'm going to take a two-year deal, one year for me to rehab, one year for me to reestablish myself as a starter, and then I'll get paid for forever by my $500 million deal. So I'm going to take a two-year deal to and make some money, and what do I want to do with those two years? Because I'm going to get paid a lot of money after that, and it's probably and it may be an organization of varying level of like you know compatibility because they're going to be paying me so much money. So what do I want to do for those two years? I want to win. I want to go find somewhere for two years where I can win. And I can be a I can be a postseason threat at the, both of those years. There's only a couple of teams that are like one guy away from like from being like like truly postseason teams, and those are the teams that are that are currently in the postseason. The Rays would be a perfect landing spot, in my opinion, for him because all the guys that are currently playing DH for the team right now can play the field. Maybe not yeah. Harold, and Harold probably would be the one that we owe seven out. If if you know if we bring in Shohei Otani, he may have to go find somewhere else to play baseball because yeah. that's that's to be an unfortunate scenario. But everybody else who's playing DH right now can and can play the field and also is a like a positive force in the field. Paredes is a above average third baseman. Yandi is a far above average first baseman. Mead can play in the in in the infield and be fine. Luke Rayleigh is a great outfielder. He can play center if you need him to. So none of our yeah. DHs are like locked in there except for really Harold. But if the if if we have to find something find you know something to do with Harold because we're bringing in Shohei Otani, I think we'll be fine. I think we'll get over it. Um but that's to me and it's it almost makes a little too much sense because like that's there's your five war. Bam. Yeah. Just Easy. throw it right in the roster. Easy. Whatever, like one points. I don't know how much war Harold Ramirez put up this season. His probably I'm gonna I'm gonna guess. I'm gonna look it up. I'm gonna guess he two put up what's your guess? Two and a bit. Two and a two half. Two and a bit. I'm gonna say one point eight base at fangraphs war. Hang on. It's loading. It's Ooh, loading. One point eight. What did I did I say one point eight? Yeah. I think I said one point eight. I'm saying one point eight. Victory. I did say 1.8. He put up 1.8 F4 last season. So you take out his 1.8 F4 and Wander's, you know, whatever F4, and you could put Harold's war back. We're doing baseball math. Don't worry about it. And <laughs> you put in Shohei Otani, the math works out. And we may even be a little bit in the positive there. 
Is it going to happen? Probably not. But that is the like, that's the easiest fix out there is just say, we're just going to bite it. And the, the, you know, we may have to walk, I may have to go and, you know, to Stu, Stu Sternberg's house and bang on his door until he makes a decision. But if you were to inject, you know, pay him 50 mil a year for two years and say, come to Tampa, we're going to get you a ring. I think we could get him a ring, and I think it would be so much fun. Don't tell me he would not absolutely kill it in that Devil Ray uniform. He would look, he would just kill it in that Devil Ray uniform. So that's my like tinfoil hat that I think he, I think that is going to, even if it's not with us, I think that is going to happen this offseason. It's going to be a short term deal for a high AAV to a contending team that he will then get either re-signed by that team. If he came with the raise, we wouldn't get re-signed by us or he, but, or he's going to get moved as he's rehabbing that second year. And he's becoming a pitcher again. And his value is sky high. He'll either get traded to, to another team, uh, a contender who's going to, you know, extend him or he'll play out his contract and then, and then get a new deal as a free agent from somebody else. That is my big tinfoil hat off season theory. You can tell me that's crazy, but I, that's my big theory. No, I'm glad you said it because I was going to say the exact same thing. We <laughs> uh, we offered Bryce Harper one year 50 million. So That's true. I would argue it's an even more prudent investment to do two years 100 million, maybe with a mutual option for a third year. Um, and then go from there. I mean, we were right there on the Freddie Freeman stakes a couple of years mm-hmm. back. We were right there with the Dodgers, true. very similar offers. I think even if you consider tax, uh, we actually had a better offer. I think that's uh, but, true. But um, he wanted to go play in LA. He wanted to, you know, whatever. anyway, he, we could, we could put that offer in. And it's, I don't think it's out of the question that Otani would go, you know what? Yeah. I'm going to rehab and then make a lot of money anyway, while rehabbing and then go earn a bajillion dollars with the Dodgers right. or the Giants or whoever in a couple of years time, once I've rehabbed. I think that's a totally reasonable explanation and it fits what the Rays would want. Can we do with an extra starter? Obviously he wouldn't be that in 2024, but yeah, we could do with an extra starter. Every team could do with an extra starter. Could we do with a left-handed power bat? Always. That's been the Rays' biggest needs for like yeah. five years. So he is both of those things. He fits the roster construction element perfectly. Uh, and I just... No, Kevin Cash will use him as a reliever at some point, and it will make Cash will use. That would be so much fun. Don't tell me that would not be so much fun. Game, game six, the World Series. Shohei Otani comes trotting out of the bullpen to close a game. Oh, cinema, cinema! I'm telling you. And then he, then he hits a, then he hits a walk off home run the next day. It would, it would be, it would be beautiful. Absolutely. We just need to get him in the playoffs by any, any metric. It so, is insane that the best player in baseball for the last several years has not played a postseason game. It's insane. Even Aaron Judge has played one postseason game, a couple postseason games recently. Like, like the best player, the most box office player in baseball has not been in the playoffs. It's a travesty. We need to, we need to, I think we need to make, I think we should make the investment. I don't, I'm going to spend Stu Sternberg's money for him. And if you want me to spend some of your money for you, I'm going to tell you where you can spend it. And that is going to be at shop. No shop.rblrsports.com. I think that's where it is. That's where you can spend your money and, and you can save an additional 10% off with promo code flappy, uh, with the, with the graphic that also uh, is sometimes up, I can tell you that it's a great place to come spend your money. Pat, go ahead and show off your shirt. It's a great shirt. Shop.rblrsports.com. If you want to look as good as Pat looks right now and make a good investment with some of your money, the way that Stu Sterberg needs to invest his money in the Rays, go ahead and go to shop.rblrsports.com. 10% off everything. Promo code FLAPPY. There's some really cool hats on there. I might be getting a hat soon. I gotta, I'm not going to lie. I saw one of those RBLR hats. Those things are fire. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be buying one of those soon. Um, so to, to kind of wrap it, we kind of round out our um, discussion on the roster. Uh, what are you, any thoughts on the outfield? Uh, yeah, just one. Um, could we get rid of Manuel Margo, save $10 because he's going to be earning $10 million next yeah. year? Should we get rid of him um, and just depend on Tapia as the defense-first, speedy kind of outfielder, backup guy? Yeah. I think there's a good, I think there's a pretty good chance of it. Um, I, I think I like Manuel Margo a lot, and he can bring a lot of offense to this team. Um when he when he needs to and he's great defensively but i think he's getting a little t- i think that 10 million they're not going to want to pay that especially when you got jose siri out there um patrolling the center field basically every day 
I think at this point, I mean, Tapia would be fine. I, I mean, it's like, whatever. I, he's a lot cheaper, and I, he was fine when he was here. Didn't do anything amazing. Wasn't horrible. Just was kind of whatever. Um, I think that would that thing that makes a lot of sense. I wouldn't be surprised to see that on opening day either. And my last, my last kind of viewpoint is obviously the Rays will carry 13 pitches because that's the maximum that you can carry, and you can never have too many pitches. We know our starting nine of Pinto Diaz, Lau, Walls, Paredes, a Rosarena, Siri, Low, Luke Rayley, let's say. And then that means we've got four bench spots. We know Bethancourt's going to get one as the backup mm -hmm. catcher. Let's yep. assume Tapia or Margot get the backup outfielder spot. Yep. Uh, let's assume Harold's there as another DH. We have got one other spot, and that would probably have to go to Oslavis Basabe as a utility infielder. That means Mead and Aranda aren't making the roster uh, this year. Do you think we need to move one of the two or both? Like you mean, like you mean, move them from an organization, like trade them from an organizational standpoint? You mean? Um, I hesitate to trade them only because you'd you'd really hate to. You lose that depth if, for some reason, one of the one of our mainline guys gets hurt. I also think if Harold, you know, if for whatever reason he just stops hitting, because Harold, I love Harold because he just hits somehow. He's Harold hits. He hits. He just does. But if he ever stops hitting, you really can't run him out there in the outfield or the infield or the anywhere field. You really can't. I just don't. I don't like seeing it. it just it's a it's a little offensive to my eyes. So to whenever he's out there, so you can't really run him out there. So then if, if, if he's not hitting well, I think it really makes sense to, to make a change there and move up either a Ronda or a Mead. Um, I think they're also uh, – I think it's one of those things too where they're, they're really good. I don't know how high their value would be to another team, so I don't know what their trade value would be. If they have if they're just lighting the world on fire down in Durham and you know we have to either make a decision of either trade – or, or move Harold. I'd rather move Harold because they're both younger and, you know, have, have a chance to, um, you know, be a develop a little bit more. I think especially need, I could see moving a Rhonda. I could see that. It, it, I wouldn't, you know, hate it. If we, if we packaged him with somebody and if we package it, let's say, let's just say we package him with Margot for, for some, for a, you know, for another starting pitcher to, for some help. I could see that, you know, that, that, that's possible. I think, I think Mead is going to be here to stay for a long time. I think he is, you know, you know, I don't know what their plans are for Brandon Lau long term. I think he might be the heir apparent at second base if Brandon Lau ever does get moved off from at some point. Um, I don't think he will. Or if they decide to move him more to a DH position sometime in the future, I don't know. But I think you know a guy like Mead would be really would be really well suited to move into that kind of a role, especially because his his defense at third is good. The arm is a little suspect. So if you put him yeah. at second, I think the glove is good. And I think the footwork and the the actual glove is good. The arm is, eh. but I think if you put him at second, that would really suit him very well. But right now you really can because you have an elite second baseman. So you don't really want to put him at second base right now, at least. Um, but I think if he kind if they kind of said, hey, go pick up a you know. I don't think a second baseman in the first. I don't think maybe you want a different glove from a second, third base. We'll say, hey, go out there and play, and go out, go out there and play second base for a season in the minors to kind of get ready for it. I think that would make a lot of sense. Um, I think Mead's going to be here for a long time. Aranda, maybe, but I don't think anytime soon. I'm all aboard the move Aranda train, and and it's not because I don't like Jonathan Aranda. I like him, uh, but uh, I don't think there's a, a real spot for him on the roster. I don't think the Rays. Um, want to give him a roster spot, really. I think they want to, I think they see better options with what else they have in the organization, despite him tearing it up at AAA. I would say Kyle Manzardo is a less proven prospect than Jonathan Aranda, and he on his own got two years of Aaron Savali. It's a good point. And Imagine what you could do if you move around uh, with those fringe 40 man guys like an Austin Shenton or a Cameron Meisner or a Margot. Um, you could get a reliable starting pitcher there. Uh, and I think if there was a trade to be made, that would be kind of what the race should be doing. Yeah, yeah. that makes a lot, of a lot of sense. And I think to that point, if you were to say package Margot and Aranda, Maybe you get a top of the rotation starter or or a middle of the rotation guy that you that you could be really happy with. Maybe the, maybe there's a chance for the race to package an Aranda, uh, a Margot, 
and a and someone else. Because at the end of the day, I I, I do hesitate to move depth, but Aranda unfortunately does not provide defensive utility the way that a guy like Mead would or like Caminero would. So he becomes sort of the first line of guys you might move because depth, as we have seen with this team, depth is so so important. So like a guy like Mead never want to see him leave because he's so valuable for, from a depth perspective for in, in yeah. that, in that sense, same thing with any of our same thing with any of the starting. If you're thinking about moving any of the starting pitchers that are at the triple A level, unthink Don't. it because we, we need those guys. Same thing with the bullpen guys, but, uh, but a DH type, we kind of have that role filled at the major league level. And the same thing that like Aranda does, he has a little more power triple A, the same kind of stuff that Aranda is doing on triple A Harold is doing on the major league level. So like, you can't really justify that. If if Harold stops doing it at the major league level, you could maybe justify, it, but he hasn't. Every time we've been like, I think this is it for Harold, he just hits again. So I, clearly, like he's just not going anywhere right now. Yeah. So lovable the, guy too. The I think the era for Jonathan Ronda to come and be a part of this roster like long term maybe have sailed with the continued success of Harold. Um, yeah. So I think I think, I Xavier, I think it's on his good, heels as well. Yeah. Agreed. Um, did you have any thoughts on the catching position? I think I think no. I'm pretty good with the catching position. Yeah, it's fine. I mean, maybe you want to sign some veteran to just chill in AAA in case of an injury, um, but you don't really need to go crazy with that. Yeah, I think I'm I'm pretty happy. I'm actually really happy with Pinto. I think Pinto could be uh, Zanino 2.0 plus maybe like a 2.5 because I think he has a little bit. I think he can maybe even eclipse what Zanino could do because I think he has a little bit more bat to ball than. Um, Zanino the one Zanino. thing that, that gives me pause with Pinto is, is, is it, I think, is everything else he does defensive wise is really good. Is blocking needs some work. Yeah, we did. We I remember we talked. Me and Ben talked about that. Uh, or did we talk about? Did we talk about that? Or me and Ben talked about that? I, don't I think remember. that was you and Ben. I think me and Ben talked about that. And um, I think what we would the conclusion we came to was all the race catchers were like meh at it. So I I I, I hope that that's something that the roster that the that the coaches focus on in the offseason as maybe like a hey if we're gonna get better at one thing here from a catching perspective let's get better at blocking a little bit because we got some guys with some wild stuff so you just kind of gonna have to be able to block because they're gonna throw some insane stuff every once in a while um you may need to be ready for it for here and there yeah so i, I, think, I think that's it do there. you have any uh do you have any last thoughts on the roster I do not. I think it's a, I think it. And again, as much as we talked about some things we don't like about the roster, we both agree. This is a very good roster because it is well constructed. There's only one really big hole in the roster right now. And most teams have more than one large hole. Yeah. So like the fact that there's only one big hole and I'm, I'm we're really over exaggerating because of the standards that we have for this team. I feel like I'm definitely over exaggerating a little bit because of the standards I have for this team. This is still an excellent roster. Still very well constructed, especially on, you know, from a depth perspective. Still very well constructed. When guys get back from injury, this team becomes really, 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 really good, even better than it already is. So it's still a really good roster. Um, I'm excited for the next year. Yeah, me too. Me too. The reason we get so antsy about just, oh, we'll run it back and do it again is just because of the standards we've seen from this race team over the past few years has been so, so high. And now we're in that horrible, horrible position going, okay, let's say if we run the roster back exactly as it is, I would estimate this team is somewhere in somewhere around the 95 win mm -hmm. kind of category. How do you improve on a team that's already set to make 95 wins? And yeah. it's really hard without taking big risks or moving on from already established players uh, to massively improve on that. Um, so it's going to be a tricky offseason, uh, but I still love this team. I think this is still a really good team. And I'm interested to see, even if there's not going to be a ton of moves made, I'm interested to see what those moves are. I am too. And who knows? Maybe we'll see Shohei Otani in a raised uniform sooner than later. Probably not, but you never know. <laughs> and if if you want to see us get really, really excited, if that ever does happen, you should like and subscribe. Uh, continue to follow this journey that we're on throughout the offseason as we continue to ramp up to the 2024 season. We'll be happy to see all of you there. Thank you guys for joining us once again and raise up. Thank you for tuning into this presentation by RBLI Sports. On your way out of the stadium, please remember to like and subscribe.